Your Excellency, Mr. T. P. Sitaram, Ambassador of India to United Arab Emirates, Dr. Ram Das Pai, Chancellor Manipal University, Dr. Ram Narayan, Vice Chancellor Manipal University, Mr. Mohan Das Pai, Chairman Manipal Global Educational Services, Dr. Ranjan Pai, MD and CEO of Manipal Education and Medical Group, Professor S. Vaitiswaran, MD and CEO, Manipal Global Education Services, and other members of the management of Manipal institutions, faculty, and staff of Manipal University, Dubai, corporate partners, esteemed invitees, including parents and dear students. I deem it a privilege to be invited to address the convocation of this University of Distinction. I take this opportunity to greet each and every one of you present here on this august occasion. I thank the Chancellor and other members of the management for this unique honor done to me. The earliest known habitation in the region of the United Arab Emirates, a federation of seven emirates, including Dubai, date back to something like 5,500 BC, there is evidence of interaction with the outside world, particularly with civilizations to the northwest in Mesopotamia. In the more recent centuries, Arabia has witnessed extraordinary intellectual prowess and knowledge creation. Further, its intellectual and trade bonds with India have always been strong and mutually beneficial. Since the seventh century, the exchange of knowledge was characterized by a high degree of scholarship and erudition and included astronomy, medicine, mathematics, and many related subjects. In the modern times, these early languages have transformed into several dimensions as exemplified by the city of Dubai. It's always a great experience to visit Dubai. Having emerged as a global city, it has established itself as a prominent regional hub for finance, trade, tourism, and shopping. This Emirate has gladly welcomed people from different parts of the world to take part in its developmental endeavors. Indians in Dubai, who constitute more than 15% of the total population, are appreciated for their dedication, hard work, and high degree of professionalism. The Manipal University, Dubai, is an important unit of the Manipal group of institutions and oasis of academic excellence and scholarship in the bigger oasis of Dubai with its multi-dimensional character as an economic powerhouse providing strong attractive force for people with entrepreneurial disposition to gravitate from all over the world, a dynamic and multi-ethnic society, and serving as a multi melting point at, of different cultures. I salute all those great men and women of the global city for their pioneering and adventurous spirit. Dear student, this spirit of Dubai, together with the preparatory orientation that your institution has imparted, is truer to give you the necessary courage and fortitude to take to face the future challenges in life. The Manipal group of institutions took the first steps through the vision of its entrepreneur and education is Padma Sri TMA Pai. It's his vision for imparting quality education to youth in India and also to other parts of the world has been very successfully and eminently carried forward by his illustrious successor, Padma Bhushan Dr. Ram Das Pai. In our country, the name of this Pai family is synonymous with banking and educational institutions, healthcare and philanthropy. The institution that they have created in these sectors have not only continuously evolved and expanded, but also are well known for quality and excellence in their performance while being concerned about the societal issues. 
we express our gratitude to these pioneers for bequeathing such fine institutions in many parts of the world, serving the cause of development, societal, and economic. I use this occasion to warmly compliment the Vice Chancellor and the members of the academic community for their laudable efforts in transforming this university into a center of erudition and excellence. Your quieter contributions to its evolution and growth ever since its inception in 2000 is reflected through the important place it enjoys among the academic institutions in the Middle East. There are many innovations you have brought to bear in formulating the academic curriculum and pedagogy. The approach you have adopted in this context helps to bridge the gap between theory and practical applications of concepts. These elements are stimulative, participatory, multidisciplinary, and designed to enable students to think practically. This is the essence of knowledge-based learning that inculcates the ability to innovate, a critical capability for being successful in any profession. Dear students, I would like to congratulate each one of you for your exceptional accomplishment here and wish you success in your chosen field of endeavor. I am sure that the spirit of competition with which you met the, challenging of the challenges of the demanding academic environment of this university will help you move ahead to realize your ambitions and aspirations with confidence. When you step out beyond the protected confines of this academic world, which is idealistic in many ways, you will have to face a real world where you need to bring to bear diverse aspects of your personality to confront the challenges of a new environment. It is also obvious that this world around you is transforming rapidly owing to the impact of scientific and technological progress. In this scenario, you were resolved to make yourself continuously relevant in professional life should never be diluted. You should not forget that in, every, in the very heart of the challenges, there are opportunities which are hidden. We could not imagine just a few decades ago that people and institutions could be connected across the world in a borderless fashion, changing the way in which organizations relate to each other and making the concept of distance somewhat obsolete. The course of the revolution is not fully known, but what is certain is that it will restructure the manufacturing processes, redistribute markets, redefine relations among new nations, refine methods of invention, and reorganize societies in every conceivable way, and will cause hard times for those who fail to adopt. On the brighter side, these new tools of technology have brought enormous capacity for increasing transparency and improving governance. The downside, however, is that they can widen the gap between the haves and the have-nots if recognition and wisdom do not guide their course of application. Thus, we are in a new age where the status quo is under challenge and the vistas of age-old institutions are in question. The sphere of education, be it liberal or creative arts, natural or technological sciences, commerce or management, is extraneous to the basic skill enhancement and passion for innovation which the education instills. The university should always have at its aim that the young graduate leaves it as a harmonious personality, not as a specialist. The development of general ability of independent thinking and judgment should always be placed foremost, not the acquisition of special knowledge. If students master the fundamentals of their subject and have learned to think and work independently, they will surely find their way and besides will better be able to adopt themselves to progress and changes that those training principally consisting of the acquiring of the detailed knowledge. World-class institutions are characterized by the existence of a large high-quality talent pool. This could be faculty, students, as well as visiting researchers. Vibrant academic and research linkages with reputed national and international institutions, 
ability of liberal resources, provide liberal resources and a flexible and conducive governance system that can recognize the sel and selectively support credible new ideas in a hassle-free fashion. Manipal University, the group, has consistently and diligently worked over the years to fulfill these multiple objectives and create new benchmarks in trend-setting research. The challenges that modern higher education face are those pertaining to relevance, quality, dealing with obsolescence of knowledge, globalization, and competitiveness, to mention a few. In my view, your university has many of the requisite attributes in this connection. A good number of PhDs among the teaching faculty, having plans to create a strong research base, as well as peer recognition of the academicians, are all good pointers to your future growth and evolution. I am sure in the years to come, this university, through its quality publications in specialized journals of high erudition and citation index, will raise its standard to higher levels. The Real life today demands us to be equipped with multiple set of skills, awareness, and knowledge. To quote my own experience, I started as a physicist, pursuing research in astronomy, later developed skills in satellite technology, and then learned system elements of system engineering, the engineering that brings together not only several disciplines of engineering and technology, but also issues related to finances, project management, and things of that kind. When I had to assume the role of leading the India's national space program, I also needed to become familiar with the aspects of socio-economic benefits of space, strategic issues, international collaboration, and above all nuances of dealing with practical, political and bureaucratic systems. Assisting me in acquiring these capabilities, there were always the undercurrents of the diverse and demanding environment and the holistic value system that my university setting gave me. And I am sure that this university has certainly imbibed these qualities in you to face your own future in a similar situation. Let me at this juncture make a few observations about our national space endeavor, in which I have been involved for decades, since it provides a good example of looking at the role of several disciplines coming together to realize specific goals. And I know that many of you are engineering graduates today, and I'm sure you'll be interested to know how many of your knowledge could be brought together for a specific goal in terms of a satellite or a rocket. Building a space system like a launch vehicle or a satellite calls for inputs from several systems or areas of engineering and technology. In the case of launch vehicle, for example, these include, among other things, structural engineering, thermal engineering, chemical engineering, including propellants, aerodynamics, propulsion systems, material sources, digital electronics and communication systems, control guidance and navigation, including use of sensors, advanced sensors like gyroscopes, and stage and satellite separate system, separation systems, and so on and so forth. In the case of satellite, for example, most of these technologies are again very relevant, but in addition to that, one has to bring to bear the questions of reliability and quality, because these systems are supposed to function for several years in the hostile environment of space without failures. In the case of planetary missions, it has to, one has to take it even to a higher level. In here, there is a requirement of a high level of autonomy to carry out the various types of functioning that a particular spacecraft has to do. Typically, for example, this spacecraft, Mars, uh, the Martian mission of India, it has to travel something like 6,000 kilometers, uh, kilom million kilometers. It took 300 days to reach the planet uh, Mars. And therefore, and also by the time it reached Mars, the communication time between Earth and the spacecraft could be as much as about 12 minutes, and for getting a return signal, it would be another 12 minutes. So you just don't have a real-time capability of controlling the spacecraft, and if anything goes wrong, 
there is not much you can do by sitting on the ground and watching it helplessly. You need to have the systems on board to ensure that these corrections are immediately made. And that is where you talk of autonomy, you talk of artificial intelligence, expert systems and all that, things which are taught in the universities today as important things, but which all come into play when you build a satellite of this type. The space program have also evolved, this is one, one aspect of when you talk about technologies. They also, the space program has also brought in some very interesting management approaches, like the concept of a configuration control and management that encompasses concurrent assessment of the technology, finances, schedule, and other parameters of a particular mission. The special demands of high-level leadership and teamwork, and this I would like to note the youngsters here, are other important elements in the broader context of conducting a space program. One has to also address the issues of institutional mechanism. It's not sufficient that you put a satellite in orbit and then expect that somebody will come and use it. You need to create all the necessary arrangements within the institutions, not only within the system that is ISRO, but also outside ISRO to make sure that the satellite is properly used, whether it is in communication, whether it is in broadcasting, or whether it is related to the natural resources survey. So these kind of institutional mechanisms have to be created. And further, one has to also know that these things ultimately have to go into industries. So there is an industrial interface. Then there are the questions of commercial and legal aspects, as well as strategies for international collaboration and cooperation. So you can, all I'm trying to bring to you is the fact that there are several dimensions to conducting a space program. And this is not purely a question of a technology. It is a question of drug science. It is also a question of applications, user community, international collaborations, legal issues, and things so on and so forth. The Indian space program has handled challenges spanning the entire gamut of these different dimensions over the last five decades, and has produced a viable space endeavor to cater to a variety of applications, like remote sensing for natural resources survey, communication systems for communication and broadcasting, or you may say scientific systems for exploration of Earth or exploration of Moon Sun, or other planetary systems and things of that kind. And ultimately, more recently, India has also embarked on a system by which you can have a navigation capability using satellite navigation systems, one of which was launched only day before yesterday. This capability has been very carefully and systematically built with full public and government support because of its demonstrated relevance to national development and security. In, execute, in executing these efforts, the leadership had to imbibe a unique work culture. This is another important element, including efficient communication between different activities and between scientists and engineers, rigorous review mechanisms, a structured management system, and above all, involving the leadership at the highest levels in all important activities. The leadership always commanded the respect among professionals and non-professionals because of the value system they brought to bear in the governance of the space organization. They created an ecosystem where people had to work together in teams without an individual losing his or her identity. Against this backdrop, I shall illustrate with an example how the lack of information on the denial, because these are high technology systems, you call them dual use, and so technologies are not, it can't, even though I said about technology or knowledge flow across the borders, these are some of the areas in which you don't have the flow of information across the borders. So you have to really think yourself and conceptualize it and then execute it. And this is precisely what spurred our young minds to be creative and innovative. I am citing this in the context of India. I will give this as an example how India built some of the world-class remote sensing systems because of the fact that we could not get this information uh, from outside. We had to first of all know what the remote sensing here means, that you put a camera in a satellite, you look at the Earth, it takes images of the Earth. Using the images of the Earth, you look at the various resource parameters of the Earth. You can use the information. The, 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 you can convert the images into information by suitable interpretation. Then you know what is the, where is the water available, groundwater, surface water bodies, 
with the, the geological features which will give you ideas of the mineralogy. You can have environmental studies including the present state of health of the forest. You can have an advanced prediction of some of the crops like the agricultural produce yield. And then you can look at the oceanographic processes and also the coastal region where you can also use it for fisheries and things of that kind. So there is a whole host of resources on which these remote sensing systems can be used once you put a camera in a satellite and hoist it in space. So this particular technology is difficult simply because, first of all, to build a satellite, you need to have a high stability. You know, when you have to hold a camera, you need to have a certain stability. Your hand cannot be moving, and then it gets smeared. So obviously, you need a tremendous stability and control on the spacecraft. That is one of the things, especially when you have to get a view. The whole idea of a satellite, why it goes and put a camera in space, is because as you go up and you have a camera, you get a better and better perspective. Just sitting, standing here, I am able to see the whole hall. If I come down there, I will be able to see only part of the hall. So that is the difference between going up and taking a picture and being there on the ground and taking the limited understanding of the local area. So that is the difference that one is talking of. So when you try to put that kind of a camera on a platform in a height of something like 800, 900 kilometers, you need to have extraordinary stability for the platform. So then you need to have extraordinary means of measuring it, control system design, and then with stability analysis and things of that kind. So these are all to be mastered, and these are not easily available as an information, as I mentioned. The camera system itself has to be designed. And one of the challenge that we faced in the whole thing is we had to launch it by ourselves. And we had a launch vehicle which is about 1,200 kilograms. And this satellite, this satellite needed something like, if you were to use the existing contemporary technology, you need to have something like 2,000 kilograms. So we had to compress it and at the same time have a performance like some of the best satellites in the Western world. That was, the, that was really the one that we really aimed for. So we need to create camera systems which are most innovative in terms of the type of sensor system, the optic systems and so on. These were not used in the way in which we designed it uh, by the Western countries. So we really could compact it and at the same time get a performance which is similar to the best satellites at that particular point in the world elsewhere. And then, of course, we had to also develop many of the technologies like the gyroscopes, the propulsion systems, and so on and so forth. And after six years to eight years of development, when the satellite was first fi finally launched and we got the first imageries from the satellite, we saw that the imageries in quality was as good as some of the best satellites in the world, especially in the Western world. So that was the first success and the type of confidence we received uh, by developing this kind of a satellite. We went to the next generation system. In fact, our engineers were really telling that why should we say that we should build a satellite like what the Western countries have done? Why don't we build a satellite? Which they will say that why can't we build, why can't we build something which India has built? We went into the next generation system and we built the IRS-1C and 1D. They became the one of the best satellite, in fact, not one, the best satellite in the civilian world carrying a multiplicity of sensor system that could really have a specification which was far superior than what was in that time available in the civilian world. So you can see that these kind of uh, uh, capabilities are possible when the youngsters apply their mind and they don't have information to start with so that they are guided by that information. And when you don't have the information, you become innovative, you become creative, and then you create world-class system. And when you also build a world-class system, then you become a pioneer. So this is where India succeeded as one of the pioneering countries in building remote sensing systems from space and providing services to a variety. And I should also say that several countries in the world receive data from this satellite, including United States, Europe, China, and so on. So that speaks of the utility of this kind of a system, a capability, uh, which is one considered as some of the very unique. I will now just uh, digress a little more and talk about an another example, which is a, again a multidisciplinary challenges that we had to face in dealing with this particular mission, the Mars mission. And there is no time for me to get into the details of this. But I will bring out one interesting challenge uh, that could really be of exciting to many of my young friends here. The demands is for the precision of propulsion, guidance. You, have to, you know, you have to go from Earth you have to transit the Earth, get into the solar gravity. It's all trying to do, maneuver it, and travel at 600,000 million kilometers, then reach Mars, and then get inserted into the Mars. So this is what that this spacecraft did over a 300 day. But what is important to no note in this is that I'll give you a little idea of what it means to go there. If uh, you, at the time of leaving the Earth, uh, when we have to fire it to put it into a solar gravity and then onto the Martian gravity, 
if we had made a mistake of a small angular distance in that in the direction and i want to say that angular distance it be 0 0.01 degree arc engineers will know what it is and this would create a dispersion equivalent to something like 20 kilometers in the normal then you have a serious problem of it not reaching the martian region and it is the the, the challenge here in pointing in that particular uh, direction which is needed for putting it into the martian orbit is like putting a 1 centimeter coin you keep it at something like 200 kilometers and then you are given a rifle to fire it if you can fire it that is the kind of a challenge that we are talking in terms of moving, moving towards the mars the other part of it is the propulsion accuracy if you make a mistake of 1 meter per second in a base value which is 11000 meters per second then if you make a mistake of 1 meter per second it will skip the mars by 200000 kilometers so because of the distance so you can see what it would have meant to design a propulsion system direct the propulsion system make it function with this kind of precision and accuracy ultimately for it to enter successfully into the martian orbit so here is an exercise in excellence encompassing perfection precision and accuracy these considerations of quality and excellence are not unique to space activity alone neither is it a one shot affair it has to be sustainable the concept of excellence should be made a part of any national culture considering nations which subscribe to this culture have the most decisive advantage in successfully competing with others in any endeavor young friends I would like to make a unique observation. This is a very good example. I thought I should not close the lecture without making this particular example. This, this, is, this shows the attitude of the modern youth, uh, like you, in the present day context. Most of you set high goals for what you want to achieve in your life. Your courage of conviction and fortitude to reach highest levels of performance, many times I have seen, is really amazing. You are not averse to take risks and face difficult and complex challenges. I will illustrate this point with the story of a set of young boys and girls, most of them below 35 years, who have embarked on an exceptional space odyssey, taking advantage of the announcement of the Google Lunar X Prize. The stated objective of this prize, and I quote, to renew our commitment to space exploration by creating a new space economy and modern day Apollo moment that inspires a new generation of innovators and explorers. This is the objective that the Google has set for this particular prize. The announcement of the Google challenges engineers, teams of engineers, innovators, and entrepreneurs from around the world to develop low cost methods of robotic space exploration. The winner will be the first privately funded team to successfully land a robot on the moon's surface and make it move by to up to 500 meters and take high quality video and still pictures of the lunar surface. Though this is what is the success criteria for this particular mission. This is an extraordinary challenge because there is no, they, they are not asking any space organization to do this. He is asking a group of youngsters to think about it and see how will you do this. And the, that's where the difference comes in. With the team of India, they boldly took it up and is working for the last three years under the leadership of a very young guy called Rahul Narayan. What is even more praiseworthy is the fact that out of the third, there were 34 competitors from different parts of the world competing in this. There have been only now three streams that have been left, two from United States and the one of Rahul Narayan from India. So you can see most of them were filtered out because many of the criteria as you move forward, they were not able to meet because of the difficulty and the challenges they face in progressing this kind of a concept. So the last teams, to, they are running still for winning the prize, the other two being there. I have met and talked to Rahul Narayan. That's why I'm, I'm, I'm talking it from the first hand experience of interacting with them is a young team of adventurous entrepreneurs who have made extraordinary progress in the last three years to take this challenge to an astonishing level. They have convinced many industrial establishments all over the world to give them hardware and software support and also made use of past veterans of the Indian Space Agency uh, through their own invitation, their own initiatives. The target set by Google is that the team must land this spacecraft on by 31st of December 
2015, that next year end, this spacecraft has to land on the moon. All these youngsters, supported by corporates and other industrial establishments, have in a short period, they have mastered the art and science of doing space, specialized in many areas of space technology in this short period, including complex trajectory calculations to reach the moon, and have identified a strategy for the overall realization of this mission, which looks to me to be an impeccable strategy that they have developed. Most of them have left their lucrative job. This is another point I would like to mention to take up this challenge. This is the spirit of the young generation. I am sure there are many among those who are graduating today from this university who have the same outlook to face the big challenges in life, fully recognizing that a block of granite, which is an obstacle in the path of the weak, becomes a stepping stone in the path of the strong. Young friends, learn from your past and envision the future. The only mistakes that are unforgivable are what that we repeat. The only challenges that are frightening are those we do not meet. You are among the fortunate few to have this opportunity of higher education in this university, which has already established its credentials for excellence. It is incumbent on you to, uh, for, to put your learning to good use in the order to contribute its own welfare, your own welfare, as well as that, your, that of your fellow beings. You would have realized that the education is not a one-step process, and it demands continuous striving to develop your personality in an integrated fashion. True education leads to the development of your physical, mental, and spiritual dimensions. Always remember that your own welfare cannot be achieved in isolation from that of the society in which you live. An educated citizen contribute at least a small part of your time in the service of others. Also, do not forget that the true fruit of education is harmony. Never before in the history are we more in need of harmony than the present time. Let us strive for the harmony of thought and action, of science and religion, of individual and society, and of anthropogenic action and environment. On this August occasion, I cannot but conclude my address in any way better than by recalling Steve Jobs' introspection. Steve Jobs, you know, the Apple founder. Introspection, after he was fired from Apple, in uh, the company which he helped to found. And I quote, sometimes life hits you in the head with a brick. Don't lose faith. And he goes on, your work is going to fill a large part of your life. And the only way to be truly satisfied is to do what you believe is great work. And the only way to do great work is to love what you do. If you haven't found it yet, keep looking. Don't settle. As with all matters of heart, you will know where to find, when to find it. Thank you.